love this slide from um, COVD is because it gives people an understanding of what somebody with CI um, actually experiences while they're reading. And then they actually experience frustration if their visual system isn't working properly. So in terms of broader impacts, this part you know quite well. Um, several people, Dr. Kafrida included, were referring to a lot of the epidemiology studies. This is uh, located online. It does list uh, Dr. Master's study as well as some of Dr. Kafrida's uh, and several others in the field. But basically what this slide summarizes is that CI is present in about 5% of the general population. And for those that have concussion, and that develops into to post-concussive syndrome, the key takeaway from Dr. Master's uh, work is she showed that one out of two of her patients with post-concussive syndrome had convergence insufficiency. So for an engineer, this screams opportunity. So after an enormous amount of work, um, and Dr. Vici knows a lot of this pain in terms of my own personal, professional, growing experience. Um, this took seven years to get. This is an NIH R01 grant, but um, after lots of rejections, finally seven years later, we finally got it in 2014. Um, the two major aims of this grant um, are, one, what is quantitatively different between somebody with convergence insufficiency without head injury and somebody with normal binocular vision? And then the second major aim is how do people change after office-based convergence and accommodative therapy? That is the protocol developed out of the convergence insufficiency treatment trial led by Dr. Uh, Scheidman. This work was also severely vetted by Dr. Cliff Shore, who was absolutely amazing to work with. I'll refer to him many times as I go on with the presentation. And then Dr. Bharat Biswal is the primary imaging lead um, to basically teach me everything that I know about functional MRI. Okay, so part one, what is different? Now, I'm not quite done with data collection, so I'm still going to be showing some pilot data from our lab as well as some other published studies. Uh, if you wait about another year, we have 80 people through our protocol and we have 10 enrolled with 10 more needed for recruitment and then once we hit that 100 mark, that's when we start publishing. But some of the things I'm going to show you is that by definition and diagnosis, people with convergence insufficiency have a larger exophoria at near compared to far. They have a decreased ability to fuse targets. One eye tends to be slower in terms of its velocity or speed compared to another. They have a decrease in brain activation and they have a decreased ability to adapt in near versus far space. And I'm going to show you data from my lab as well as others and all of these experiments and more are being done on an N or 100 subjects moving forward. In the essence of time, I'll pass that, and I'm also going to pass through what FORI is, because I know this audience knows that. So, step one, eye movements. As I mentioned, my background is engineering. I trained under John Semlo, who trained under Larry Stark, and we love our instruments. Here what you see are dynamic eye movement recordings. The part right here that I'm showing is a binocularly normal control. This is done in a haploscope, so we're really studying disparity vergence only. We ask somebody to look at a target at far and then jump it quickly. That's a jump duction or a vergence step. And each colored trace is a vergence eye movement. Key takeaways from this is this is about 25 responses. This is what we call an ensemble. And the person is able to fuse their next target well within one second. And the variability of these eye movements is quite low or small. Here is a convergence insufficiency patient without head injury. I'm going to show you some of Dr. Scheinman's results, which we just got published this year on brain injury patients with CI. But key differences, and this is where when people are starting to say their complaints, it makes sense that they're starting to report double vision because here it takes 
the person almost two seconds to get to their new target. And initially, when we start the experiment, they're able to make the movements, but you can see they quickly fall apart, and it takes them a lot longer to do that same task. So one of the examples that Dr. Scheinman uses that I absolutely love is he says, you know, you might be able to, as convergence insufficiency patients, you might be able to do the task but it's the equivalent analogy of you have somebody on a treadmill that's flat and the patient is actually on a treadmill that's raised. And while you might both be able to get there, the patient is going to have to work a lot harder to do the same amount of work. And what this slide is showing is that indeed that person is able to do it, but it takes them a lot longer. Now, what I find even more fascinating is this is the same patient after 12 hours of vision therapy. And these are one-hour sessions in the lab on different days. And while they're not quite as optimal as the binocular normal control, you can see they can do the movement much faster. There's still more variability than the control, but it's much less than before the therapy began.